It is good to see you today. And wherever you may be joining us from online, we want to say thanks for taking the time that we could be together for a few minutes today. Um, I want to welcome you to this study called Hashtag Humble Brag. When you don't want to draw attention to how much you really want attention. Let me see if I can paint the picture for you. Your friend complains. Complains about how swamped she is in her new director's role. And she's so stressed that she's lost 10 pounds and can even fit into her old jeans from high school. That series of complaints can be translated this way. She's proud of her, of her new position, and she knows she looks better than ever. That's a hashtag humble brag. It, it is a grasp, if you will, for status. It is a need to feed the ego. And in this series, we are using this, this word, this, this phrase, this dance with pride to recognize the impact that it has on relationships. Let me tell you a story. Jen and I had been married for more than a year. <clears throat> And we had just moved to a new apartment in a new city. Now, let me give you some background. We met at 14. We became a couple at 15. And then we just grew up together for the next five years, waiting to be old enough to take the leap. We knew each other's strengths, we knew each other's weaknesses, we knew the stuff we had in common, we, we knew where we were different. I adore her. We love each other. The new apartment is nice. I mean, it's, it's more than spacious enough for the two of us. And it was an all-inclusive price which I know doesn't sound like a big deal to you, but in that day, like this was, this was some 30 years ago, and we felt like God just kind of gave us this, this cool place where we just paid one amount per month and all the bills were included in that. And that was a big deal not to get any surprises to our limited budget as I'm working on a master's degree and she's working full-time as an administrative assistant for a church fundraising organization. God had recently called me, us, to full-time ministry. We knew that I needed to get some training and we believed that this is where God wanted us to be. And God was providing and we were taking successful steps. I'm doing well in school. I mean, I loved it way more than college. I'm, I'm trying to build my connections with, with pastors who would let me preach for them while they were on vacation. And, and in my extra time, I'm enjoying playing golf, usually with my professors and some school administrators. I mean, you know, rubbing shoulders, building relationships. This is awesome. We're young, we're healthy. But Jen is struggling. She wasn't defiant. She wasn't mean. She was just not happy. At first, at first, it was really just a, a few tears. That's the way I would describe it. A few tears here and there when she would talk about where we used to live. 
But as the months followed, it got worse. The tears, they increased. And the sadness, it increased. And my frustration, it increased. How do you deal with that? What do you do in that kind of a situation? Well, today, I'm here to help you. And so I, I'm going to make some suggestions to you. And I, I, maybe you want to write this down because I'm telling you what I'm about to give you, I have, I have found it to be highly effective. All right? What, what do you do in, in those kind of moments? I'm going to present it in some questions. This is, this is what you could ask. How can you be unhappy? I mean, don't you love our life together? Are you writing this down? I mean, don't you, don't, you, don't you think that this is exactly where God has called us to be? And, and don't, don't you recognize that, I mean, he's given us this amazing place to live on our budget? He's, he's given you a great job. He's given me a, a, a great school. And if none of that works, then here's how you bring it home. But if you want to leave, then okay. Let's pack up and we'll head back home. I mean, we, we both thought this is what God was directing us toward, but you know what? I'll quit school and we'll figure out another way and we'll go back to our old life. Let me translate that for you. If you can't get it together, then you know what? Let's just hang up on what we think God is telling us to do and I mean I don't really want to but I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated with this and I'm tired of dealing with this and to be honest you've, you've driven me to it this is the approach that I would recommend it's called the convince and convict method and I have found it to be highly highly effective the convince and convict method i hope that this helps you in your relationships and i'll see you next week <laughs> please don't leave and please don't use that method now look i, I did not say all of those things with those exact words. But I wasn't far from some of it as I dealt foolishly with the frustration. Now, I want you to hear me. She and I both, we, we knew Jesus. She and I both fully aware of the biblical principles packed away in Scripture. I adore her. We love each other. But in one short season, I missed seeing how she was hurting. See, she wasn't being selfish. 
she wasn't ungrateful for what God had given us. She didn't even really want to leave and go back home. She was just dealing with the fact that prior to this move, she had lived her whole entire life in the same place. For 20 years, 20 years of familiarity, 20 years of family, 20 years of friends, none of which moved with us to our new location. And I was so excited about this new calling on my life, right? You know how it is when you sense God talks to you and like you get some direction and like I know where I'm supposed to go and a new school and a new city and a new apartment and she's just trying to hold it together. And I missed it. Because I'm excited for me. And maybe you would say, because you care about me. Well, maybe she could have like said something a little sooner. You know what I mean? Or maybe maybe she she could have been a little clearer in that. To which I would like to say, congratulations. You are better at the convince and convict method than you may have thought you were. And if I had another rope, I would add it to the fence here because there's nothing more effective than telling somebody who's hurting that they should do a better job in their hurting. Look, here's what I'm telling you. That is the kind of circumstance that I see happen in marriages all the time. I'm talking about struggles that are just a part of life. It begins with an understandable struggle, a reasonable hurt, but the way it gets handled doesn't actually remove any barriers. It actually adds to the barriers. It creates more of the barriers, which leads to further distance. It leads to disappointment. It leads to distrust. And before you know it, you suddenly look up and in this relationship, it feels like you're trapped. It feels like a prison. So the question is, is there something better than the convince and convict method? And the good news is, yes, there is. And it is what we are studying right now in the book of Philippians in chapter two, the apostle Paul is laying out just some amazing statements to us that apply to our relationships. Let me show you what we're learning. If Philippians chapter two, verse five, that's where we're gonna start. Here's, here's what he says, have this mind. I, 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 he says, I, I want you to not just think this way, but it, it literally means an attitude set. Right, I, I want you to see this way. I want you to be able to feel this way. I, I want you to operate this way. I, I want you to have this attitude set, check it out, among yourselves. What does that mean? It means in all your relationships, like marriage, right? In all your relationships, I, I, I want you to have this attitude set, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, that's really important, what we're talking about here. And this is something that comes in connection with, it, it comes in this relationship with Jesus, who we're about to read. I mean, he, he is God himself, but understand what we're learning is not a Jesus who is just telling you the way you should do it. No, what we're about to read is this is the Jesus who has this mindset and it's what he actually lived out for you and me. Jesus, 
who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. You know what that means? He's God. He's God and all that it means to be God and all of his power and in, in all of his honor, he's God. But he did not count that as something to be grasped, but emptied himself. Does not mean that he ceased to be God, but he's, he's about to, to, to take a, a step here. He empties himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He, here's our summary word, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So, we look at this text and uh, uh, humility. I mean, he, here is God who is demonstrating a, a humility. What does it mean to be humble? Here's what we learn in this text. It starts with releasing status. I, I am releasing that, that power, that, that need to feed my ego, right? That, that need for, for self. No, I am releasing status and I am emptying self in order to embrace servanthood. That is what it looks like to be humble, and that is what Jesus did for us. It is the opposite of selfish. It is the opposite of grasping the power, the opposite of grasping the status, that which I need to, to make me, right? No, it's the opposite of that. It's seeing others as worthy to be served, even at a cost to self. And that's what Jesus did for us. And therefore, that's what husbands do who love their wives like Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. That's a whole lot better approach than convince and convict. Because isn't it crazy how we'll try something on somebody else that there ain't no way I'd let you do that to me. Right? You try to convince and convict me, right? What are we doing? We're, but isn't it crazy? We'll actually try that. No, what if, what if what Jesus is saying here really is the key when we struggle in those relationships? Somewhere along the way, I heard this statement. I don't know who said it first, but somewhere along the way, I learned this statement. Marriage is great right after it kills you. Now, I don't know what the original, right, intent of that statement was when the person said it the first time, but I have embraced it because I think it's absolutely true. When you learn to release status and you learn to empty self, and you learn to embrace serving one another. In other words, when you love to die to self, when that dies, marriage becomes something great. When you're not living for self, but suddenly you're serving one another. When the hurts occur, and the focus is not on what is this costing me, but the, the focus becomes how, how can I love and how can I serve? Suddenly marriage becomes better. It becomes great right after you learn to die to self. Around here for many years, we've kind of used the, the, the phrasing step to the back of the line. It, it, it means that that. In a marriage, for example, each, each partner is saying, look, you first. And the other's going, no, you first. And so you step to the back of the line in order for, for you to go first. It's putting each other first. And so speaking of first, 
Here's what I want to zero in on today as we are launching into, right, how how do we do this right in our relationships? This is the big picture that I want to zero in today. Jesus made the first move. What I mean is in this mindset, right, in this attitude set that Jesus has in the way that that he interacts with you and me, he made the first move. And I'm going to say he made the first move before you even knew he needed to make a move. Before you even realized that there was an issue between you and him, he made the first move. The scripture says, while we were sinners, he did what? He died for us. In other words, do you understand that Jesus did not let my behavior, your behavior, my actions, your actions keep him from moving first? And he took the step toward us. So, when you and I are dealing with relationships, when you and I are dealing with with struggles, I mean, uh, you and I, come on, we know sometimes we could have a tendency to let the other person's action, the other person's behavior, I mean, that's why we got this conflict going on anyway, sometimes we can let that be the reason that we don't take action. We're not going to Take any first step toward them. Well, Jesus, knowing that that would be our struggle, knowing that that was going to be something that most of us would wrestle with, he asked us a really interesting question. And even if you haven't been a a part of church for, for much of your life, you may have heard this statement along the way, and maybe you just didn't know that it was Jesus who actually said it. But he asked this question. Why do you look at the little bitty speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, sister's eye, family member's eye, friend's eye, co-worker's eye, teammate's eye? Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. Why are you focused on the little bitty thing that they did that you have absolutely no control over and yet you are ignoring what what you did that you can actually do something about? And here's the way that most of us, I think, tend to respond to Jesus' question to us. Jesus, I think perhaps that you've got this backwards. I think, I think you're a little bit confused, Jesus, because that, that what's in their eye, it is not something little. It is huge. What they did is huge. They stole from me. She left me. She, she said she would and then she didn't, right? He, he ruined this. They, they, they took, and we got, it was huge. And Jesus, I saw it. I saw what they did with my own eyes. I know what they did. That was not my fault. And if they would just acknowledge what they've done that I know to be so, then I'd be ready to talk. So Jesus asked another question. So how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? He's not going to let this go. Jesus said, why are you acting like you, you can fix them? It's like I'm acting like it because I can I can fix them. I 
I can fix this issue, if you will allow me to fix you because you are broken, here's what you've done and here's what it's cost us. If you will just listen to me, then you will be able to see like I see this situation. And Jesus says you are missing the point here because you can't see. In fact, in this, in this verse, in verse 4, when he says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, the next little phrase, when all the time, that's, that's an interesting phrase, it, 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 it's, sort of, it's sort of like this, this um, um, phrasing that would be, well, how about that? It's a, it's a let, let, let me take the speck out of your eye when, well, wait a minute, check this out. Behold, there's a plank in your own eye. And he said, you've got this backwards here, verse 5. Uh-oh, you hypocrite. It means pretender. It means you actor. In other words, you're busted. Because Jesus has said, I know. And we go, okay, so Jesus, then what, what I hear you saying is we each have our issues, right? I, he, he's got the thing in his eye that you say is a speck. I'm saying it's more like a plank. And I, uh, uh, okay, you know, maybe, maybe I... I have something in my own eye because I realize that, that none of us are perfect. So what you're saying is we, we each have our own issues and I should just focus on me and mind my own business. That's the point. And Jesus says, no, that's not the point. The point is start with your own business. In other words, you make the first move. And I go, but Jesus, I didn't start this. And really, in the whole scope of it, my part of this is so little. I mean, really, the, the stuff in my, it, it was really just the reaction to what they started. That's all it is. It was just my reaction to what they did and Jesus says, good, let's start with that. And you take the first step. So I want to give you a prayer today that I am convinced God answers. People are always looking, what, 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 almost like people looking for magic prayers, you know, that God will answer. The one I'm about to give you I am convinced God will answer. And today I'm challenging you to learn how to pray it in your relationships. This is how it goes. God, please show me where I am at fault. And man, I'm telling you, if you pray it, don't be shocked if you are already getting some feedback from him by the time you finish the sentence. God, will you show me where I'm at fault? Because it was really just, it was just my reaction to what they did. That, that's, that's what I did wrong. I should not. And he goes, good. Let's talk about that. Let's start there. Would you be Would you just be willing to ask? And let me be clear here. I'm not talking about asking your friend who is on your side in the whole argument that's going on and, and she agrees with you of how he treated you, right? Uh, or he agrees with you of how she, and, and I'm not talking about asking your friend who agrees with you and believes you ought to dig in your heels, right? I, I'm not talking about asking your mama who she's on your side no matter what, right? That, that's just, you, you know you can always go to her if you're looking for something. I'm saying ask God. 
God, will you please show me where I am at fault? And the cool thing is when you do that, God attaches a promise to this. So look at verse 5 again. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye. That's God, where am I at fault here? God, what, 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 is it, what is it that I need to see? First, you take the step, and then you will see clearly. A promise. A promise. That all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute. That this is not exactly what I thought this was about. And the answer is, yeah, it's because you had something in your eye. And you couldn't clearly see even what was going on with them. But I love the fact that there is no period right there. It doesn't stop with you will see clearly. It says then you will see clearly to remove the stick, the, the speck from your brother's eye. In other words, now... You're in a better place to start helping them. Because something that was between you and them has been removed. And now I can see better than I could before. You didn't get there by promoting yourself. You didn't get there by protecting your status. You got there because you were humble. So here's the statement I want to challenge you with today. This is the action that I want to challenge all of us with today. This is the way I would say you take the first step toward them regardless of who first stepped away. You take the first step toward them regardless of who first stepped away. Now, in this kind of situation where you see two people who are struggling in a relationship, would you not agree with me that you and I would expect the most mature of the two in the relationship would be the one to take the first step. Wouldn't we? Like if you're, if you're just watching this happen from a distance and you see two people struggling, you would go, the most mature is supposed to be the one to take the first step. <laughs> I'm saying you already think you're the most mature. So guess what your move is? Step toward them. You step toward them regardless of who first stepped away. Because all you're doing, you're just doing what you wish the other person would do. And come on, come on, hear, hear what I'm saying. If we are not willing to do what we think they should do, then what does that make us? Uh hypocrite oh man Jesus was right he was right now look I'm going to make this brief statement and today's purpose is not to dive into this but I'm going to make this statement there are rare times when it may not be safe for someone to take a first step towards someone in a maybe in a physical sense, um, I, I'm going to say there are rare times when it may not be safe to do so. And I'm not going to elaborate on all that, but I'm simply going to say, if you think that's your situation, man, would we, any of our pastors, man, it, it, we would be honored to sit down and talk with you about that situation and how do you go about it because there are rare times when I believe that to be the case. But 99% of the time, that's not the story 
for most of us. It's just that we are angry and we are disgusted and we are wounded by what's happened. But when you take that first step toward them, your humility in going first, it is opening the door that maybe, just maybe, opens the door for them that they don't know how to open by themselves. Sometimes that's what God does. And even if it doesn't, you suddenly realize you are free. You're not trapped anymore because you have been willing to ask the question, God, God, show me. You've, you've been willing to deal with that. There is a, a freedom that comes in this. And, and I'm telling you, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. This is what he did. And typically our, our response might be to this kind of a, of a moment, yes, yes, I have forgiven them and that's all that matters. And I'm gonna say, mm, no, no. Forgiveness is not all there is. And forgiveness is not the end. We often say it that way, I think, in our Western approach, um, even to our faith. This is a between me and God thing. And so, yeah, I got this thing going on with this person, but you know what? God knows that I have forgiven them. God knows it. And I'm going to remind you this morning, Jesus did not just forgive us. He also brought us back. He didn't just forgive my sin. He reconciled me to God. And we go, okay, but Jeff, what if they don't? Like, like what, what if I, what if I take the first step? Like, what if I, I own my part of it? I, I, I genuinely realize, hey, here's where I was at fault and here's how I should, what I should not have said. Here's how I shouldn't respond to it. And, and what if I like take the first step, even though I wasn't the first one to step away, what if I do and they, they don't want to reconcile? And I'm saying you gotta realize that's the part you can't control. And so in a way, we could say, your goal is not reconciliation because you can't set goals for other people. Now, don't get me wrong, you wanna, you wanna see reconciliation. You, so you pray that there could be reconciliation. You, you, you really desire that to be the case, but you, you really can't set that as your goal because you can't make a goal for somebody else because you can't control somebody else. What you can control is the first step. The first step. Whew. Man, this is like, this is tough stuff. And then I'm saying, yes, it is, but come on. You know what's through the ropes? Joy. On the other side of the ropes, there's joy. And some of us perhaps have been caught in these struggling relationships for so long that we don't realize the toll that it takes on our life. There is a toll that it takes on your soul. And it's not just even emotional. I mean, it can be physical, certainly spiritual. Right, you've never been to the counselor and the counselor said to you, oh, your problem is from healthy relationships. No, we know that when relationships are healthy, there's a beautiful thing that comes out of all that. There's joy. I'm saying it's worth the risk 
It's worth the risk for what's through the ropes. And I just want to encourage today those of you who are in those relationships, how much better it is when both of you have that view. Hey man, I, I don't even know how to tell you how grateful. But, uh, I can celebrate as long as Jen and I have been married and all the times of struggle that have occurred that in different situations, each of us willing to take that first step because as much as it hurt, we knew how beautiful it is through the ropes. You first, no, you first. No, you, you first, no, you first. And so we're running to the back of the line, putting each other first, except, except, when it comes to the moments that suddenly there's a barrier, then each of us willing to say, I'll go first. I'll go first. Because here's where I was wrong. This is willing, this is worth fighting for. And it's what it means to follow Jesus who did this very thing for us. I'm going to pray for us. We'll process a little bit. We're going to sing a little bit the truth of who he is, a time for us to maybe do something with this. There are some of you, you know, you, you know, you, you, you like already made the mistake while I was talking. You kind of prayed that prayer of God show me and it, there's already stuff. There's already stuff. What are we going to do with that? Let's ask him to help us follow. I'm going to pray, and then we'll have the opportunity to do that. Let's pray together. <clears throat> God, I'm pretty sure there aren't too many of us involved in this talk today who cannot relate in some way this kind of struggle. God, sometimes it really does just come out of just the hurts in this world that you tell us is gonna be a part. And yet what we do with it and how we respond. God, today we are asking you to help us. For some of us, it is to completely change our approach. And to thank you that today maybe you've given us eyes to see that we have been trying to manage somebody else. We have been trying to set the agenda for somebody else. We, we have been trying to, to, to convince and convict. But the way through the barriers, it only comes when we go low. And when we release self, and we embrace serving. Dear God, I'm asking you to give us courage today to walk those truths out. For some, it may be marriage today. For some, it's friendships. For some, it's, it, it may be relationships within families. God, there, there can be things that have gone on for years and years and years to the point that, that we realize sometimes we can't even remember where it started. And unfortunately, sometimes, God, we are guilty of waiting all the way to a funeral before we finally say what we should have said a long time ago. Dear God, today I am asking that you would empower your kids to walk like you walk. You would empower your kids to have the courage to ask you to show us where we are at fault, that you would clear our eyes and you would help us to love like you love. Oh God, today I am praying that there could be joy that returns to relationships across this body, 
stories of forgiveness, stories of reconciliation, stories of following you. I ask your blessing on these, your people. Give us faith to follow. Clean our heart and let us see. In the name of Jesus, I ask it.